Good evening. Nobody's reputation is so high these days that it can't be undermined by allegations of abuse. Nobody is too important, too revered or too dead. Five police forces are investigating the former Prime Minister, Sir Edward Heath, even though his ashes have been interred in Salisbury Cathedral for a decade. Bishop George Bell, the famous opponent of the Nazis and the closest thing to a saint the Anglican Church has had for generations, has been dead half a century. But his church has disowned him after a woman came forward to accuse him of abusing her as a child just after the Second World War. The church has formally apologised and paid £15,000 compensation. On the balance of probabilities, as they put it, the accusations were true. Buildings called after him will be renamed. Even the flowers on his memorial have been removed. All this has been widely reported. You cannot libel the dead. There's a long list of other public men, dead, dying or elderly, under a similar cloud. There are a lot of arguments about this. There are those who see it as a waste of time, effort and money which could be better used pursuing current offenders, such as the Rochdale gang the police overlooked for so long. But the moral questions are more complex. Should the dead have the same rights as the living? Should time temper justice for dead celebrities or 90-year-old Auschwitz bookkeepers? And what is justice for, anyway? Punishing the guilty, establishing the truth, or restitution and closure for the victims? That's our Moral Maze tonight. Our panel, Claire Fox from the Institute of Ideas, and Mikel Voy, Senior Editor at The Economist, the Chief Executive of the RSA, Matthew Taylor, and the priest and polemicist, uh, Giles Fraser. And Mikel Voy, should you uh, be safe in the grave, whatever you may or may not have done? Uh, no, Michael, I, I don't think that the silence of the grave should be a shroud for truth. And so it is justifiable and I think indeed morally <coughs> required to pursue crimes after death. And that, that applies just as much to those who uh, have committed war crimes or to those who are alleged to have committed uh, sex abuse now. Claire Fox? Well, you have to be safe from criminal justice if you're dead because you can't get a fair trial because you can't be cross-examined and therefore uh, the criminal justice system has to keep out of it. But I've got a greater sort of squeamishness about this. I just feel there's so much kind of easy moral certainty in denouncing paedophiles and child abuse. And you just think, yes, there's hardly anyone going to support it. That To bandy it round and then to mean that anyone who challenges it can be accused of being an apologist is a morally reprehensible atmosphere at the moment. I'm very nervous about it. Matthew Turner? I think it's a sad but inevitable aspect of our judicial system that people can be falsely accused as well as justly accused. And I think it's a sad truth of the human condition that the dead can't answer back. But neither of these things make me want to silence genuine victims. Giles Fraser. Being able to answer your accusers in a court of law is a fundamental principle of criminal justice. And, of course, I want abusers caught and I want them prosecuted. But everyone deserves a fair trial. And some people, if you're dead, you're beyond that. And we mustn't, we mustn't lose that uh, connection with justice and criminal trial. Panel, thanks very much indeed. Our first witness is Peter Hitchens, the author, commentator on current affairs and Mail on Sunday columnist, of course, who's been particularly exercised by the Bishop Bell case. Um, uh, Peter Hitchens, can you, in a nutshell, tell me why you think the Bishop and, and perhaps Sir Edward Heath have been unjustly treated? Well, I'll stay away from Edward Heath, though. I think he has been, unju has been unjustly treated because I, I care less about him. George Bell's reputation is so important to those people who value his immense courage and his, his great passion for truth, which was what distinguished him throughout his life, and who feel that to have that reputation thrown into the trash can on the basis of a very, very old uh, allegation made by one person uncorroborated is a serious mistake and deprives this country of an important example of goodness which it badly needs. Amaka, what? But just to, to pick you up straight a, a, away on, on that, Peter Hitchens, I mean, this, an, an allegation made by one person on right. can also be correct. And what then do you think is the status of, of crimes that, that come to light after the person is dead? Morally, what is the status? Well, an allegation can be correct, but we can't talk of victims unless we can have trials in which the, 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 the allegation can be proved to be true beyond reasonable doubt. We can talk about alleged victims and alleged survivors, but we cannot use the language of, of guilt and proof where there has been none. And I think we have a moral duty, and I think this applies both to public bodies, such such as the police and indeed the Church of England and also to powerful media organisations such as the BBC and newspapers to respect
respect in death the presumption of innocence which is so vital in life. We, we always observe this distinction when people are alive, and indeed if we don't we get into serious trouble because it is a factual distinction. Someone who's been proven to be guilty is in a completely different state, state from someone who has been accused. But as soon as they're dead, it seems as if, especially over the case of Bishop Bell, people are free to presume guilt and to treat him as if he's guilty even though nothing has been proven. I think your argument has the benefit of clarity, but is there well, no, nothing? <laughs> is there nothing in it? And in fact, I think that is part of the problem here. Because the other side of that is that all you have to do to get out with your your reputation not being tarnished or not being looked at uh, with with a really you know with the, the eye that a judicial process brings to it is you just have to be dead. Death, on the contrary, death lets you off the hook. No, on the contrary, and in fact, one can easily cite the, the counterexample of Jimmy Savile against whom there is such a cloud of witnesses and, and so much corroboration, and against whom so many things were said when he was alive that I think it is reasonable for people to uh, to actually say here, even in the absence of a trial, uh, we can say that the presumption of innocence has been tested and found not to not to hold. But, In the case of George Bell, the thing th- simply isn't comparable. There but is, then, are, say, you, one, aren't you simply one choosing which you choose to believe, Peter, or, or which any no, of us might choose to no, believe? On your own logic, no, as I you laid it, you, just a quick during, question, as you laid it out, you should still be talking about alleged in the case of Jimmy Savile, because he's... No, I don't feel so, because I think that one of the things which which, which does actually, would actually make a trial work, would be, would be corroboration and many witnesses of the same crime, and also, as I, as I do point out, accusations were made against him when he was alive and they were not proceeded on, which was shocking. Now, in the case of George Bell, that is not true and not true and not true. And uh, this, this is the fundamental difference. I have... I would... Uh, I would absolutely, if I found... And I've looked into this as hard as I possibly can and I continue to do so. If I found... Any second accusation, I would doubt seriously the cause which I was fighting. There has, as there has so far been none. There has, simply has not been enough to justify the treatment of this great man as, uh, as if he were a convicted criminal, and not just a convicted criminal, but convicted of something which destroys his reputation forever afterwards. Matthew Turner? If the Church of England genuinely believed, having looked at this properly, that on the balance of probability uh, that this abuse took place and that indeed they had been responsible for not taking this accusation seriously at an earlier stage. Wasn't it their responsibility to own up to that? In a sense, let's not talk here about George Bell, but that their responsibility is the church to say we should have done something about this when we first heard it. Well, there is a lot of stuff about the balance of probability, but in fact there has been no case, in a, in a civil case even, in which the balance of probability is, is, the, operating, is the operating rule. Uh, the, the, the plaintiff actually challenges... But if they felt they'd done no, it no, no, this, this is vital. But I'm trying to move the plaintiff, on. The plaintiff challenges the defendant, the defendant defends himself. Yes, I know. In the, on this occasion, the church is... Many people looking outside think, oh, well, the church... No, no, they think from outside. The church is defending is, is defending Bishop Bell and is looking after his interests. I'm On the contrary, in this case, the church was so worried about the fact that it had failed seriously, particularly in the Chichester Diocese, to do anything much about child abuse for so long that it really, really didn't care about George <coughs> Bell at all and was quite happy to throw him under the bus in the, in the hope of looking as if it were resolute. Uh, okay, and that is exactly I, I don't, what the church I, I, did. I, I, they were I, not... I, 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 wasn't, there was no balance of probabilities ever established. And Matthew? I think there is a difference between the responsibility that an institution has to look at itself and what it has done, which then has an implication in terms of what is said about an individual. Let's move on from that. What I, well, you is your, I, I, I is your, like to ask is how, your, how thorough their investigations it, were into the Well, we, none of us know that, do we? So, well, um, um, is, your, is there any extent to which you believe that a false accusation against somebody who is a person of great virtue and standing is of a different order, morally, than a false accusation against somebody who has no particular merit. Well, yes, in this case, because if I believe this accusation to be true, then George George Bell's reputation would crumble into ashes and filth before my eyes, and it would cease to exist. And and it's a huge reputation. I I understand that. So you have to to pay some attention to the the rules of justice when deciding whether to trust it. I absolutely understand that point. The problem is this. Isn't it exactly that sense that were we to allow this accusation to be true, that we would be taking apart a person, an institution, what led people to hide abuse in the Catholic Church, uh, other cover-ups, because people said, if we were to admit this possibility, which at the very beginning seems remote, its consequences 
would be terrible. Quite, I completely agree, and I, I, I personally feel that it, it's quite right that the person making this claim has been treated with great sympathy. I, I don't even object to having been compensated or to having re received a, a, a comforting and sympathetic letter. I think the benefit of the doubt should be given to, to unhappy people in these circumstances, and I don't have, have any regrets at all about that, nor do I oppose it. And I think that absolutely every accusation of this kind should be taken with the utmost seriousness. But that should be balanced with a similar seriousness given to the... To, to the, to, the, to the right of the accused person, whether dead or alive, to the presumption of innocence, you, without which we, would you, we live in a tyranny. And would you feel it was the same moral harm were we to be discussing this case and the person who'd been accused was, you know, uh, somebody of, of, of no merit, no status, no virtue, not someone of courage, but just an ordinary person? Would you uh, be as exercised about it? Well, not... No, because it's, this, isn't, this, is, this isn't a case of a great reputation being destroyed. I wouldn't be as exercised about it, but I would be just as exercised about the, the right of the accused person uh, to to be given the presumption of innocence and the right of the accuser to be treated seriously and have his or her accusations <coughs> treated with seriousness and examined properly to the end. And if they turn out to be true, then it doesn't matter how great the reputation is, the reputation goes in the bin. Peter Hitchens, thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Uh, our next witness is uh, Mark Watts, who's uh, the editor-in-chief of the news website Exaro, which has made a, a speciality of investigations into historic child sex abuse. Um, investigating the dead is relatively risk-free for you, I suppose, but what, though, is the point and where is the justice? Well, I think one ha does have to recognise that there are competing interests and great care does need to be taken about everyone's reputation, dead or alive. I don't think there's any grounds for just riding roughshod over uh, the reputation of someone who's dead. Um, but you also have to ask, where is the abuse survivor in all this? And where is the abuse survivor in all what we've just heard from uh, Peter? The critical thing, in my view, is to arrive, trying to arrive at the truth. And that is the case whether you are a media outlet uh, or whether you are a judicial process. And bear in mind, you know, at inquests, quite often terrible things are said about people who are dead and there's no question about the inquest should still happen. It serves a necessary purpose. And we need to recognise that there, there's a lot of evidence. I think there's overwhelming evidence that there has been a cover-up or a series of cover-ups, to be more accurate, uh, over um, uh, allegations, evidence of uh, sex abuse by an array of prominent people, and right now I think we, the country, need to know the full truth of it. Claire Fox. OK, leaving the cover-up aside, um, uh, I'm afraid well, that's that quite is... quite important. Well, <laughs> well, maybe we'll come back to it. OK, we've just heard the, um, the, the notion that dead people can't defend themselves. In, in a court of law, that's certainly the case. How can, therefore the dead defend themselves if they're going to be accused of the most heinous of crimes? I mean, is that, how do we deal with that? Well, as I say, I think you do have to um, not just ride roughshod over, over the reputation of someone who's dead. Um, and, uh, you know, I gave the example of inquests where terrible things could be said about someone who's dead and, and, and uh, the job of an inquest is to examine the evidence that's available, which doesn't include the person who's died for obvious yeah. reasons. But it is possible to but assess you, the evidence and come to a conclusion. You, you Here we are at the BBC where Sir Jimmy Savile has just been the subject yeah, of a massive uh, review yeah, so where we, we conclusions have been reached. So, so the thing that's interesting is that... If, for example, uh, you, you talked about cover-up, because there's a certain degree of, or I would argue, a certain degree of paranoia in the uh, police force, in the establishment, about the fact that there's now people who think there's cover-ups everywhere you look and a certain amount of conspiracy mongering, I'm sure you weren't doing that. Um, is there not a danger, say, when you've got a police chief standing outside uh, Edward Heath's house who actually says that he wants to uh, uh, encourage those who have been victims of Heath... Uh, to get in touch with the police, that means that Heath is guilty. That's what he just proclaimed on television. Heath has victims. Well, I think the thing is, I, I cannot explain why Wiltshire Police did that, and the reason I can't explain it is because I don't know the underlying facts, and it is the underlying facts Well, I don't care whether there are any underlying facts. To do that on the television, in that way, without a trial... It depends on whether he had a proper basis for doing it. And actually, it's not possible to judge from what's known about that investigation. Is that not so the far. construction of a crime, the trawling, the. Uh, if, no, it's, seeking, it's seeking witnesses. I mean, there are clearly dangers about trawling, but I think he's. Well, why, why then does he call them victims? 
if they were witnesses? Why call them victims? A big difference. Can you let him answer, please, Claire? Um, well, um, uh, I mean, I don't know about the Wiltshire Police investigation and the justification for what they did. I do know that, as it happens, uh, Edward Heath was under investigation by another police investigation. This is in the public domain, yeah. Operation Midland, and, and they are were investigating what they regard as credible so um, no qualms. allegations. So no qualms. Amazing. So uh, just you've said that, you know, where is the voice of the uh, sexually abused in this? Where is the victim? voice. That's what you said was a critical point for you. It's is one there, a is, critical point. Is there not a danger that in the in the in the uh, way that we kind of are also desperate to not look as they were being insensitive to the victims or actually the alleged victims um, and, and people who have been sexually abused, that actually we do sacrifice due process? I, I don't think so, because I think that with people... Uh, I, I think we we have uh, plenty of people who will come out to defend the great and the good. I don't remember the great and the good coming out to defend John Charles de Menezes, who was one dead and traduced outrageously uh, by the media, spurred on by the police, it turns out. Well, and, and no one, there, was, there was no great, the great, great, there was no great nice request right. for him. Okay. Giles Brayton? Sounds like a moral crusade you're on. I don't know about a moral crusade. It's a moral crusade for the truth. We do need to know what on earth happened at the Church of England, what on earth happened at the BBC, what on earth happened at the Met and the police forces, um, why was Cyril Smith not investigated? There's an yeah. awful lot we need to know. So, on this, so it's a crusade for the truth. On this moral crusade for the truth, I understand how, if it goes to court, how that works. There's a jury and all of that sort of stuff. But on your newspaper... How, how does it... Website, website paper, big one. Uh, how, how does this not become sort of trial by journalism? Well, I think... I, I mean, if you're saying that journalists don't have a kind of right to investigate no, this no, no, area... No, no, I mean, no, I'm I just talking about the tried and the, the whole thing seems to be packaged up. We... I mean, we at Exero have never said that any given person is guilty of any crime. What we have done is reported on evidence, and evidence does include personal testimony from individuals, um, witness testimony, if you like. We have been very careful not to say, for example, any of the allegations in Operation Midland, including allegations against Ted Heath, are definitely true. You'll notice that a, a lot of the sort of other side of the coin have been very... Have, have expressly said that they're false. And I think it's both... That would be wrong to say they're true or false because... That is not for us to do at this stage because we can't tell do, yet. Do you worry a little bit, though, that, that the information that you're they're pushing out there into the public domain does potentially prejudice future trials, that it's, it may not be a, absolutely sub judice because it's, you know, a cry, a crime hasn't started, but it's in the spirit of sub judice that you could, be, you, you could I, I, be... We absolutely don't do that. And, I, I mean, as it happened, the Solicitor General felt the need to issue a warning to the media uh, last September, I think it was, uh, about um, not saying firmly the, that specific allegations are true or false if they're under criminal investigation. We've never done that at Exero, but there's been plenty of media that have done the opposite to say they're definitely false and that is wrong. One, one of the things that you, you have developed uh, some sort of reputation, problematic reputation for perhaps, is, is the way in which some of the people that you've promoted um, as it were your pastoral care of them I mean some of them have, have accused you of pushing them forward into a media scrum and not taking terribly good care of, of the victims in this well, I, I don't think Darren that's, particularly. I don't think that's true or fair. We have taken enormous care with um, abuse survivors who've come forward to us. Um, it, it is the case that there are abuse survivors who have, as it were, fallen out with the police, social services, and indeed us and every other party you could name. That has happened. I accept that. But we, uh, you know, we have taken enormous care. I think we probably go beyond the care of call of duty, as it were, on that one. Mark Watts, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed. Our next witness is uh, uh, the barrister uh, Barbara Hewson QC, who's been a prominent critic of the way historic sex abu abuse cases have been handled. Um, uh, do you think there should be some sort of time limit, some sort of statute of limitations in these cases? Well, I do personally... I, by the way, I'm not a QC, I'm just saying that for the record. Sorry. That's all right. Um, I don't want anyone Promoted thinking you. that I'm... <laughs> <laughs> got promotion when I haven't had it. But um, yes, I do. And I think I think the thing is that when you're looking at the role of the courts and the role of the courts in doing justice, um, it's important to realise that it's not a perfect instrument um, and that what it's trying to do is to achieve justice within the resources that are available. And when you bring very old complaints before a court, the court's in a difficulty because it hasn't got the kind of evidence that you would normally have to enable real justice to be done. And so what you then get is what one senior judge in Ireland described as a kind of parody of justice, where people may be 
wrongly accused and may be convicted because there's a sense of outrage and they are unfortunate enough to have been brought before the courts at the time when this outrage is very, very powerful and juries are swayed by it. So there is a real risk of injustice. And there's also a risk that people may be possibly resorting to the courts to settle old scores sometimes. Indeed. Matthew Taylor? Yeah, well, these are, these are risks that are inherent in the legal process, but we're talking about whether something has got worse. So uh, you're, you're, you're suggesting uh, that, for, if I got this right, if you're a 60-year-old woman who was abused as a child and you want to act against the person who did that abuse, um, who happens to die, not talk about that, that accuse the person, that, that they should just be told to put it behind them, get on with their lives? Well, I'm not saying that, because people have always been free to tell their story, people have been free to write memoirs, and people have very often done so. People write memoirs about school days recording terrible things that have happened to them when they were at school. So what's the problem? Um, and the point is they can explain what's happened to them, but they don't necessarily need or, I would say, want to bring it into a criminal forum because that's completely different. But they might bring it into a criminal forum because, and this is often what happens, because they did complain. They complained to somebody, but nobody listened to it. I mean, for example, if you look at what happened in the Catholic Church, the issue there was not so much about... It was about the priests, but it was also about the culpability of the entire church in covering up the actions of that priest. So they talk about that case because there is still an institution that is... Uh, liable for what happened? Well, you can make people liable in a civil context and there's a statute of limitation for civil claims. Most countries these days do have criminal statutes of limitation and, and the UK and Ireland are actually unusual in not having these. So I think what we're talking about is a common law system that's developed differently it, to does, other countries. Does it not worry you that at the beginning of the exposure of... Um activities in the Catholic Church. It was, a, it was a, a few people, and they were saying, talking about things that happened a long time ago, and people said this can't possibly be true, and if it hadn't been for the fact that some people were very brave and took that seriously, the entire... What was a conspiracy would never have been exposed. Well, institutions have always had scandals. I mean, this is not a new thing, actually. If you look back at history, you've seen that there have been scandals over schools, there have been scandals over homes for the mentally infirm, where there have been terrible abuses. So this problem that we're grappling with is not a, a new one. I think what's new is the idea that people should be brought to book for very old claims, when a lot of evidence may have disappeared. And what's interesting about it is you get this switch, because you've moved from the situation where someone's very young and powerless and isn't listened to, when they first make their complaint against someone who is in a powerful position. But by the time some of these cases get heard, it's completely changed. There's been a 360-degree degree turn, and you've got a very old, infirm person right. can we, can we who just, can't really respond. Can, can just, and I don't I, I, think that's I, I, fair. I understand your, your, your implication that, as it were, we've gone too far towards... I think so. ..gone towards, too far towards the victims. Can I just ask you a very specific question? In the second half of the 20th century, broadly speaking, do you think there were more people who suffered as a consequence of false allegations or more people who suffered as a consequence of being abused and not being listened to? Which group It was the larger group, in your I view? I can't answer that. Well, you can, can't you? No, of yes, course you I can. can't. No, I can't. Surely the number of people who were abused and never got taken seriously was infinitely greater than the number of people who got accused falsely. Well, I don't agree, because if you look at That's the 1990s ridiculous. care That's home ridiculous. scandal... There were large numbers of complaints, a lot of which were drummed up by very adverse media coverage. But when they were scrutinised by the prosecuting authorities, hundreds of accusations were not taken forward. So there were an awful lot of complaints which were drummed up as a result of um, publicity and so forth. Anne McElroy? You, you've made a very clear legal definition, explain what distinction, sorry, and explain why, why you think that is right and proper to uphold that death is simply a, di a different category. Do you have any moral qualms that your desire to protect the dead because they cannot answer back can end up with you kind of colluding, unwillingly, I'm sure, but in, in cover-ups? No, um, I don't. Not? And the reason why I think that is because I actually think we've gone too far the other way in thinking that it's important for people to actually go through the process of a very public discussion of what may have mm. happened to them. But that's and your, I that, think, why is it for you to judge that, um, as opposed I, to the person who has suffered, or even allegedly suffered? Well, because I think for a lot of people who suffer, it's not actually very pleasant for them to be hearing constantly what we hear constantly now, is this constant preoccupation with a particular type of crime. Because let's face it, 
A, there are a lot of nasty crimes out there. B, there are a lot of people who suffered for all sorts of reasons. There are people who suffered the most appalling racial discrimination back in 60s and 70s. Should we leave it to them? They, I mean, they, 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 they don't can choose get whether offered they any forward. sort of redress at all. They're not considered as even important. There are people who are suffering in care homes who are very elderly. They're not on the radar at all in terms of public Yeah, but we're drifting off track in a very important. short amount no, of time. But, but this is important because I think that there's a risk of privileging a particular type of person who suffered a particular type of experience... And the question is, why do you want to do that? And necessarily, is it good for everyone to be constantly focusing on one type of experience as opposed to another which may be equally bad but, and but morally But we can't judge what's good for everyone. We can simply... There is a balance of harms here, surely. And... The other point that I wanted to raise with you was you know, the, the, the dead are actually not so far from us. There is a continuum between the dead and the living. And in almost every case, there is there are people around who are witnesses or who could be called upon. So you know, why do you make death such a dividing line in the legal argument? Well, you can't prosecute dead people. That's ludicrous. I mean, that's... Yes, but you could use judicial process. No, of course you can't. What judicial process can you use? So the dead are you completely can't summon the, the dead. You can't question them, you can't caution them, you can't do anything about them. And the best you can do is to sue their estate if they're wealthy. So they can't be brought some money to actually. justice posthumously? Only in a civil court, but not in a criminal court. Barbara Hewson, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Our last witness is uh, uh, Malcolm Johnson, who's a partner in BL Claims <clears throat> uh, Solicitors, which is a specialist in child abuse compensation claims, and uh, a former chairman of the Association of Child Abuse uh, Lawyers. Um, uh, w w whether those uh, ac accused are still alive or not, hasn't the present situation um, created an open season for fantasies or worse? Uh, no, I, I don't believe it does. What, what we have here is we now have a system which, which is exposing the real extent of the problem. Now, that wasn't something that we had 20 years ago. Um, but the criminal courts are now prepared to prosecute people many years after the event. The police are prepared to take allegations forward. And what we're seeing um, is something that reflects the reality of child abuse in this country. Giles Fraser? Are you comfortable for those who make accusations of sexual abuse to be called victims before they have any sort of trial? Um, I, I'm not. I, I tend to use the word survivor. Um, and the reason for that is, is that victims is a rather hard word. And uh, many people who have been through abuse regard themselves as having survived the experience because it can be akin to... So let me to ask the question yes. again with mm. that. Are you comfortable for those who make accusations of sexual abuse to call themselves survivors? I imply that there's something that terribly awful that they've survived yes yes i'm comfortable Be before any kind of trial uh, yes indeed. so what so what process has their victimhood been established in your mind well this is what they say i'm not saying that because they're saying it it's true they still but have to go through the legal process you called them survivors so you're really implying that they're they have, they have something that they have survived no no that i some, don't that I... some abuse has happened that they have survived that mm. seems to be the common sense reading of what it is well, no that as, said. as a lawyer i could never accept that just because somebody makes an accusation it is true they have to right. go through the process like everybody else i don't think the word victim or survivor makes any difference so you don't, you don't think there's any implication in the word survivor that they've survived something? No, no, they're simply describing themselves in a certain way, but it's a more positive way to describe oneself. OK, I mean, I, I understand. How do we... How do we... How do we um, uh, I mean, I, I have enormous sympathy with what you're trying to do, but then the Paul Gambaccini type of examples come yeah. up, mm. and it just seems to me that in the, in the desire to find and expose all of this historic sexual abuse. Mm. There can be a different sort of victim, and those victims who are falsely accused. Mm. And how do we stop your juggernaut I think we sweeping up there? Uh, uh, Mr yeah. Gamaccini uh, uh, had no case to answer in the end. Well, uh, sorry, I was... Yeah. But he yeah. was no, still sorry, but just a point the, of clarification. I, I mean, yeah, I mean yeah. I, I, he was yeah. still swept up in this, exactly. in this terrible exactly. thing. No, he, he certainly was, and it cost him a great deal of money, yes. and it, it caused damage to his reputation. Uh, what I would say to that is that you have a system which provides that if you make an allegation, then it will be investigated by the police. It also means that the wheels of the law mean that the police will go and question a person and that that person's identity will probably be name, made known to the public. Now, there is a reason for that. And one of the practical reasons is that by naming that particular person, other people may come forward. Frequently what you find in these cases is when people come into court and they give evidence, they do not know one another. 
because survivors of abuse, victims of abuse, think that they're the only person being abused. They don't know one another. Now, Claire. that is a crucial part in our, our prosecution process. Claire Fox? I, I just want to clarify that, mm. you know, things have changed very recently. You know, uh, Operation Utree document uh, giving victims a voice actually changed the terms that we use. I mean, you might not like victim, but they said we should say victims, not accusers. Mm. That's what they said. They said yeah. that we should call unproven allegations and mm. change that to evidence. Mm. So is there not a danger of of an undermining of undue process due to a kind of politicisation or guilt mm. that the CPS and the police didn't zealously do their job in the past? There's always a danger. There's always a danger in these cases that we do, will have witch hunts. There's always a danger that yep. it will become so emotive that we will lose sight of oh. the due process of justice. But I, I don't accept that calling somebody a victim or a survivor okay. has you, any bearing But you recognise the danger of due process... I mean, yes. you know, of due process yeah. undermined and witch hunts, which yes. some people are saying. Now, in this atmosphere, which I think is mm. verging on witch hunt... Um, uh, in fact, our previous witness has written, but I also agree with mm. her, that there's, we tend to lump together quite serious offences, such as rape, uh, um, uh, with possibly more trivial or certainly lesser misdemeanours. But today, you, they're lumped together. Do you think there's a worry, then, that we have a kind of panic reaction to all sexual matters? Um, I, I, I don't think that the authorities panic when they deal with these matters. Most police officers who are the, uh, uh, constitute the main thrust of the prosecutions, what they will do is they will deal with them sensibly and according to a plan. But I'm slightly going beyond mm. the legal uh, prosecution right. point. I'm talking about the, the sense that sexual abuse is everywhere, people... Are, and and mm. f forgive me, but you'll know what when, you know... Um, do you think there is a distinction, let's put it this way, do you think there's a distinction that it's worth making regularly that there's a very small many instances where, for example, you have the rape of a two- or three-year-old mm -hmm. and that that is very, very different, not to be counted in the same category as a 21-year-old who gropes a 15-year-old? Well, no, I think that's too simplistic a way of looking at it because oh, what the 21-year-old does to the 15-year-old um, uh, may be absolutely devastating. That's the point about a sexual crime. That's why they're treated Yes, but, I mean, all sorts of crimes might be devastating, but we, mm. we make a distinction. I mean, if a child is run over in a mm. car accident, yeah. it's just as devastating to the parents as if they were butchered and murdered, but the law and society mm. recognises devastating to the victim mm. is not the same as saying they're the same morally... Unintended car accident, you know, different matter than uh, intention. In, 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 indeed, but the law treats sexual crimes differently from crimes such as running people over. That I think that's the point. That but I'm, I was I'm trying making. to say, within the sexual crimes, mm. are we yes. allowed to make those distinctions much clearly <clears throat> than they do at the moment? But I think the distinction is made by the courts already. If you read the Sexual Offences Act 2003, it provides for different sentences and different penalties for different types of crimes. Malcolm Johnson, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, just review what we've uh, panel what we've what we've he heard tonight. Uh, a very basic point at the at the beginning. Peter Hitchens said we have a moral duty to uh, respect the presumption of innocence in death as in life for dead people as well as live ones. Um, I, I think Matthew. I, I think both Peter Hitchens and Barbara Houston were kind of missing a very important point here because we keep talking in this programme about prosecuting and, and pursuing the dead. What is m much more often the case is that the reason that the behaviour of someone who has died is being discussed is because it could lead, firstly, to the prosecution of those who are still living mm. and, secondly, to the condemnation of an institution which had failed to take something seriously. Now, I don't know what happened in the Church of England's decision about George Bell, but I suspect that what drove their decision was not a desire to expose George Bell. It was a recognition that had they not revealed that these accusations had been made, had it later come out that they had known that they had been made and they had then discovered them again and they had not said anything about it, it would not have been George Bell who had been condemned. It would have been the Church of England that would have been condemned. But so uh, that distinction has uh, been if, lost if, tonight, if, I think. If, if, if Peter Hitchens had been here to hear you say that, he, he would have another explanation that had to do with the Church feeling a little bit guilty that it hadn't done something well, that, better, that, that, better that, in, that, in that, other that, cases. That, 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 that
but that says maybe the point is these cases are explored because of the ramifications for living people and yeah, institutions. I, I understand the point, Charles. I mean, I, I, on the George Bell thing, I, I, I think there's a there's a real due process thing and fairness thing here, and um, because the Diocese of Chichester had so many historic. Um, uh, uh, instances of abuse and 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 the church had denied it and covered it up the church went from saying trust me he's innocent to trust me he's guilty and the problem was the trust me bit and the trust me bit because there wasn't a transparent and due process and it's not and that's the thing george bell may be guilty he may be innocent we will never we will never know that but the due process that ascertains what should they it, have done what should they have done not should they have not revealed it or should they have said we had this accusation but we don't think it's true and I in mean, any case it wasn't a court process yes yes it wasn't a court process it was done through a civil it was done through a civil uh, claim uh, there wasn't any opportunity for George Boyle, anybody on his behalf to, to answer back. At least we don't know because we don't know the process. It was held in secret, and I just don't like it. Uh, uh, Claire, Claire the, uh, Peter Hitchens again made a, made a moral distinction between the case of uh, uh, Bishop Bell, perhaps Edward Heath, on the one hand, where the accusers are either in single accusers or at least one or two, uh, uh, and the huge uh, weight of evidence uh, uh, pressing on somebody like uh, Jimmy Savile where presumably uh, the presumption of innocence fails to carry quite the same weight with Peter. Well, I'm, yeah, he, he's obviously got a common sense point, mm. and, uh, which I can accept, but I think that, I think that kind of almost becomes a bit pernickety in, in, in as much as Jimmy Savile's become... You know, Jimmy Savile, who was an exceptionally uh, psychopathic, mm. as far as we can tell, guy, is now the basis on which the Savile effect is basically that everybody is wandering around assuming that Jimmy Savile's around every corner. And if you read all of the literature on, on child abuse and institutions, I think what's happening is toxic in institutions, institutions that have had a problem of child abuse in the past, are now almost conducting an inquisition. I mean, the Catholic Church has found inquisition again. The Church of England seems to be doing it. You can but, but be Claire, put, sent to the stake. Claire, um, um, that is what happens when things that were wrongly buried for many, many yeah. years and mm. decades come to light. And yes, we have to be very careful with it and the handling of it in the media and elsewhere, but it, it is it is just a side effect of that. But you must still see, and I can't really kind of get away from this feeling about with uh, you know P Peter Hitchens and the third witness, that this desire to sort of truth and to find out whether things were, were true that were really damaging and should come to light was somehow buried because they were worried too, they were worried too much that they couldn't get around the fact that, that you can't produce a dead person as a witness. It's not a Google story. But this seemed then to sort of cut off any avenue of using any form of due process to deal with very bad things that happened. And that worried me a lot. Uh, know, our second witness, Mark Watts, uh, the investigative journalist from the website, uh, also uh, placed a lot of emphasis on the truth uh, as his objective. But he also <coughs> uh, did... did Say where are the abuse survivors and talk darkly of, uh, of covers up. I'm I thought sure he was, the I, 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 cover -ups. I, I mean, I, I actually agree with Claire that I think the use of the word victims without saying alleged victims mm. is a mistake, and mm. I think he mm. should have said that. Well, I, I do think, I however, think, I think that Giles pushed that point fairly well. He, he did, and I, I do think he did make another good point though, which is that uh, Ed, Ted Heath's defenders are out there. And they are saying everywhere that it's not true. Now, that means, by implication, that they are saying those people who have accused him are liars or fantasists. So there are... Let's not forget that there are other victims. Just as people are saying, well, Ted Heath may be the victim of false accusations, it may be that we are inviting people to come to the media, accusing those people who have been abused of being liars and fantasists. Can I, can yeah. I just remind ourselves what's happening? There are so many police investigations and historic abuse cases going on at the moment. You can't keep up with them. There's whole police force is dedicated to trawling to find victims. They're not all reporting the crime. This is a situation where the police are looking for people to report a crime. They're saying, I mean, it's completely turned that whole criminal justice system on its head. You then have tragic, terrible, awful stories of people like Harvey Proctor, who's had to go on the television and say, I mean, accused of the most vile things, murder, and, and there's a real atmosphere of conspiracy. And, of course, the great thing about conspiracy theory is, is as soon as you say, can I question whether you have any evidence of this, they say, well, we all know, people will be tweeting this as we speak, but, that you join the, you've joined the establishment, Claire, you're part of the cover-up. So I'm very nervous about an atmosphere... But, 
that's morally corrupting that's emerged in relation but, to But, is this. there an argument for, for, for uh, you know, naming people in these cases of, of well, trawling, I suppose, is, is what the critics would call it? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not too happy about this use of the word trawling because it does seem to su- suggest that you're simply you know, going out there to kind of invent something or in order to create a kind of maypole and you're hoping other people come and, and dance around it. In fact, the reason that we're so-called trawling, Claire, is that if there is, and it's a big if, I, I admit this is a conditional, if you believe that there is enough evidence that a crime has occurred and you think that other people may have been affected, it seems perfectly reasonable for the police or any other body to, to go out and ask them to come forward. I cannot see what the problem is with it. Anyone who is then absolutely unfairly accused or their name is dragged into it is more than within their rights to stand up and say, not me, and to, uh, and to ask to have their name uh, removed. Um, but that, that is really, that's fine. That is better than the cover-ups that we've had. Uh, Barbara Houston, the, uh, the, the barrister, uh, Matthew, it's a utilitarian, but it's also a moral point, said that the problem with a period of time, a long period of time, between the offence and, uh, and, and, and all this uh, coming to light... Uh, an already imperfect justice uh, is is that much more imperfect because yeah, yeah, acquiring yes. the right uh, evidence, course. there is also this sense of outrage of course, around but I it. Don't, of course, but, you know, it is already the case that if you are giving evidence in court and you say something happened last Tuesday, you'll be taken more seriously if you say it happened 40 years ago. That is mm. the kind of thing yes. that juries and barristers have to weigh up. I thought the really telling thing about Barbara Houston was that when I asked her whether or not she felt that there was an issue, a major issue, mm. about child abuse not being taken seriously and child abuse being covered up in the second half of the 20th century, and there is overwhelming evidence that that was a massive issue, she simply denies it. Now, I wonder why it is... She said she couldn't say. Well, but she... She didn't deny it. She did yeah, but, but, yeah, yeah, one at a time, please. Yeah, but you can say. You can absolutely, unambiguously say that a handful of people who may have been falsely accused uh, <laughs> do not amount to hundreds of thousands of people, all the survey evidence suggests, who did suffer child abuse, who didn't speak about it and didn't talk about it and never got redressed. Not even to recognise that makes me wonder. When she talks about the pendulum swinging the other way... Uh, uh, can I just... Just the one thing that I think is very important Claire. is let's think about the rule of law and justice rather than the sort of grand sense of truth which journalism mm. can pursue and, and so on. In courts, sometimes you might even know that someone's guilty. But if there's no evidence, say somebody's destroyed the evidence, it doesn't matter, no matter what you think. It doesn't even matter what the truth is. Because once we say that we lower the burden of proof or that evidence doesn't matter or that we get rid... Just hold on. That we get rid of due process, what then occurs is the state has the right to round any of us up for anything. So, so the reason why she is stressing the importance of not going down that line and won't play a numbers game with you about how many here, how many there is, even for one person, right, to be falsely accused by uh, uh, undermining the rule of law is destructive to the whole of society morally. That's the point. about social facts. Uh, Giles, uh, apart from your coup and with the last witness of, of, of getting him to say that calling somebody a survivor didn't imply they'd survived something, um, the witch hunt element, we're running out of time. Oh, it, I mean, Do you I, think it's a witch hunt? There is a witch hunt element to some of the Do you know, I'm, I'm in a total... The, I, this is a moral mason, because on the one hand, there'll be people listening to this programme who have been abused and will not be believed and may not be believed and may not... And that's absolutely a terrible situation and we must do all we can to make that come out. But also there'll be people who like Paul Gambaccini who are, who are falsely accused. I mean, the great thing about... Christianity, I suppose, in this is that there's no immunity from prosecution when you're dead, in my faith. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Giles, thanks. Uh, that's it for this week from uh, panel uh, McElvoy, Claire Fox, Giles Fraser, and Matthew Taylor, and from me. Until the same time next week, goodbye. <laughs>